Psalm 42, I'll read the entirety of the psalm. Let's give attention to it. This is God's word. And so let's give diligent attention to it even this afternoon. Psalm 42, it is to the choir mascal. It is a choir master. It is a mascal of the sons of Korah. There we read, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in the procession to the house of God, with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon from Mount Mizar, deep cause to deep, the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do, why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God, amen. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will abide forever, amen. Let us pray together. Our God, as we turn now to this, your word, a word that is living and active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, a word that is able to discern the very thoughts and intentions of our own hearts, we ask that you would help us, that your spirit would attend all that is said and all that is heard, that your spirit would teach us, he would guide us, and that he would open our ears and our eyes to the truths of your word. We pray that you'd be gracious to us, minister to the needs of your people through the preaching of your word, we ask for Christ's sake. Amen. Perhaps you have heard the expression, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Many of you have used that, I suspect. Many of you have perhaps married couples when your spouse is away for any length of time. You begin to sense that. You recognize that very truth, that truism that exists. Of course, it's very real. Absence does indeed make the heart grow fonder. Maybe it happens to you grandparents when you haven't seen your grandchildren in some time. And you, of course, recognize the truth of that very expression and how you long, maybe even ache, uh, to see them. Maybe it occurs when you are deprived of some blessing. The heart usually responds with a fondness that should have been there all along, but maybe now it comes to the surface in a very real way. The fact is, this psalm is one that we are familiar with, undoubtedly, especially the opening words of the psalm, is one that I suspect is badly misunderstood by most in the church today. You might find even Psalm 42, verse 1, stuck on Hallmark cards in some places and some stores across our country. But the issue, of course, of Psalm 42 is very much the problem of the psalmist in that his heart is aching, His heart is longing. His heart desires to be in the worship of God. This is the issue. This is what's precisely driving the psalmist, the sons of Korah, to write the things that are being written. There is an emotional aspect penned deeply within this psalm that drives at the very problem of a providential hindrance from being in the corporate expression of God's worship. He could have started the psalm with the very words that I began the sermon. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. Absence from worship makes the heart long, or at least it ought to. 
make the heart long to be with God's people in a public expression of worship. Many have used this psalm to gird up their souls, to strengthen their souls in times of difficulty and trial. And while that isn't necessarily wrong, and it, while it's not necessarily beyond the pale of the things that the psalmist says, the precise matter that's causing all of the strife for this man, these men who are writing these things, is that they are missing, deeply so, missing uh, the public worship of the saints. And it's driving them to despair. It's driving them to frustration. It's driving them to long even more so for God's worship. Now today, because of the technology that we have available to us, uh, we are live streaming this service. That is to say that we are able to take what we are doing in this room and we're able to at least put it in someone else's living room in some way, shape, or form, some capacity that they might benefit somewhat from what you are benefiting from in a much deeper way as you sit here this afternoon. But it is no substitute for being where God's people are. It is no substitute to simply watch a service on a television screen or a computer screen or a smartphone. No, part of the joy of being in worship publicly each Lord's Day is that we get to see one another, be with one another, enjoy one another, sing with one another, and to hear the Word of God preached together as one people. And when that isn't happening, when it can't happen for providential reasons, I wonder, does your soul ache the way the psalmist's soul aches here? Do you miss it? Does it bother you? Do you see it as something lost that you cannot get back? Even if you were to listen to my sermon on a Tuesday, you cannot get it back because Jesus is here. God himself, the triune God, is meeting with you specially, corporately, in a unique way, right this minute, right this hour, in a way he does not do so in other times of the week. This is not to say that you cannot benefit from listening to sermons on a Tuesday. But there are something missing, and it will be missing, because this is the way that God has ordained for his people to grow together in the pilgrimage that he has placed them on, to learn from him, hear from him, to enjoy him, primarily here on the Lord's Day. Do you miss it? Some of you, of course, have the privilege of going on vacation. When on vacation, do you go to church? Or does your Christianity take a vacation with you? Do you miss being in church when you're not able to be? This is the point of the psalmist. And through his words, we are encouraged and in fact exhorted to look honestly at our own attitudes about what is the most important hour of your week and evaluate it rightly. Maybe repent, maybe turn away from our lackadaisical approach to worship, Maybe lay hold of that which God himself offers you and his wisdom gives to you this every Lord's Day as an expression of his favor, his love to you, he might help you. You see, these are issues, my friends, as you listen to this psalm, these are issues you're going to have to wrestle with yourself. I certainly am not going to cover every possible angle that relates to this subject, and I would love to be able to do that because this happens to be one of my favorite subjects. But to be honest, I wish it were yours too. The worship of God. Can there be anything greater than that? Indeed, for all of eternity of which the Lord's Day is a picture, we will be doing this free from the encumbrances, free from the distractions, free from the sin that so easily besets us, free from all of those things that cause us to not miss worship when we ought to. But we will be 
with great joy and great delight. And so this afternoon, with God's help, I want to show you the ache and the sadness of the psalmist as he was prevented from public worship and how you must respond to his concern to pend for you. I want to show you, uh, with God's help, that the Spirit of God put this psalm in here, at least uh, in part, uh, maybe in, in total, to show us how we should be, how we should respond, how we should re uh, behave when we are prevented providentially. We should ache and be sad that we cannot be with God's people, prevented from worship, and how we must respond then, therefore, to the things that he says, they say, in this psalm. Two points as we consider this psalm together. We're going to first consider the psalmist's problem, and then we will consider the psalmist's attitude. The psalmist's problem and the psalmist's attitude. The sermon is not arranged in, in a, a analytical format. It's a synthetic outline, which means I will be moving around the psalm in order to sustain the argument that I've already presented that the argument is indeed how we ought to feel, how we ought to behave, how we ought to respond when we are prevented from public worship, even as the psalmist was himself. First, the psalmist's problem. I don't need to belabor this too long because I already have done so. The problem is simple. There is an absence. He has been prevented. He is absent from the public gathering of the saints of the Lord. He asked the question in the end of verse 2 when he says, when shall I come and appear before God? He again comes back to this very theme in verse 4. These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go. In the past tense, he's reflecting upon that which he has done before or they have done before. He would go with the throng and lead them in the procession. Where? To the house of God. How? With glad shouts and songs of praise. He is describing the worship that he would engage in with his brothers and sisters at one time or many times in his past. Verse 5, he comes back to that same theme once again. How he remembers how he says to his soul to hope in God, for I will again, I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. It wasn't that the psalmist could not worship privately. Many of you have that spiritual discipline. We, when I was growing up, we called it quiet time. If you knew me as a child, you knew there was no such thing as quiet time. Even if I was forced to be quiet, I was not quiet and quiet time. That's what we called it. Some of you call it devotions. Some of you call it private worship. Call it whatever you like to call it. It's that time in which you sit down before your Bible, you read it, you, you, you think on it, you hopefully are meditating on it, you're allowing it to speak to your life, and you pray in response to it, perhaps praying to others as, about other needs of the church as well. And while that is fine and good, the psalmist is not describing that problem. He certainly could do that. He, he could go off into his prayer closet and he could have this time, but that's not what's causing him strife. What was lacking in his life is something far greater, and he knew that. Something far greater than his private quiet time or his morning devotions or whatever phrase you would like to use. What was lacking in this man in his life was the anticipation and the actual performance of worshiping publicly with the saints. Now you might ask, as I, if I were sitting out there, I, you might ask, well, why is then therefore public worship to be preferred over private? I mean, after all, Pastor Bill, when you come visit us in our homes, you do ask us if you're reading your Bible. I do ask that. Because I want you to. Of course I do. It is the bread of life for your soul. And if you don't ingest it, if you don't read it, if you don't think on it, you won't grow. 
But if I were to come visit you because you haven't been coming to worship, I can assure you that I'd ask that too. Because I'm convinced, as I believe the Bible clearly shows to us, and especially this psalm highlights for us, that public worship, the por corporate gathering of God's people, is to be preferred over private worship. This is not to say that you should not read your Bible. This is to say that this is more important than any devotional time you'll ever spend. David Clarkson, in his sermon titled, public worship to be preferred before private presents 12 reasons. I know a collective groan. Okay, don't panic. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each one. Of course, my clock and your clock are not typically the same, I recognize, but 12 reasons to demonstrate that public worship is more important than private. First, the Lord is more glorified by public worship than private. Why? Because he looks down upon you as one people, as a collective body that sing praises to him. It's not to say that he's not glorified by your singular praise by yourself, but he's more glorified when he sees his people doing it publicly. Before the watching world, with their brothers and sisters. Second, there's more of the Lord's presence in public worship than in private. You might think, wait a minute, that violates, you know, everything, you know, God's omnipresent. Isn't he everywhere at once always? Yes, he is, but he's more particularly interested in ministering to the body of believers here in which he does. This is why he would call the saints of old to himself there at the tabernacle, and they would come collectively as the priest and the, the, Levi, the tribe of Levi, the priest within that tribe would minister to the needs of the people by not only uh, administering uh, and, and officiating at the sacrifices, but they would also be teaching the law. And they would teach collectively. They would speak to the people in that manner. Third, God manifests himself more clearly in public worship than in private. Well, how does he do that? Well, he does so primarily through what is happening right now. As his word goes forth through a man called by him, trained, vetted, taught, approved. Larger Catechism 158. To preach, thus saith the Lord. That is to say simply that when you hear the word of God preached here in public worship, you are hearing the very living voice of Christ to you insofar as it's faithful to the Word of God. And so it's here that he manifests that to you as he seeks through a minister, your pastor, to communicate to you the things that you need. In other words, to say that the sermons are not something that are just given, but they're crafted for you. As a minister worth anything, sits in his study week after week, he's, his mind is on you. He's on your life. He's on your heart. He thinks of you. He prays for you. He does these things so that he might tailor make a sermon that God might manifest himself to you through that sermon specifically for you because, well, you're here and I'm not talking to people in the parking lot. Fourth, there is more spiritual advantage in the use of public worship. Why? Well, because first, the preaching of the word. Second, the administration of the sacraments that are given to strengthen the people of God. We don't do that privately. And if you are, you need to stop. Fifth, public worship is far more edifying than private. I can't even begin to tell you how many times I have experienced that myself, and maybe you have too, and my poor wife gets to hear it sometimes because I'll get all excited about something I've read and I just gotta tell somebody. As we hear people singing, as even the psalmist makes reference to at the very end of the psalm, and praise and adoration of God, that music, that song, helps, it, it, it helps encourage and edify our brothers and sisters, for we know not what they are wrestling with, what they are going through. Six, public worship is better security against apostasy than private worship. I have heard this so many times. I think if I had a dollar, I wouldn't have to do this for a living. I can worship God anywhere all by myself. I can go out in the trees and do it there. Well, yes, I guess you can. 
But that's not the way God ordered it, nor did he ordain it that way. And my friends, I, I can't be more clear on this one point. When you begin to absent yourself from the public expression of God's worship, apostasy itself is right around the corner. It is not that far away. I don't know how far, but not far. It is the means that God has given to the church that he might sustain and uphold you, that he might keep you on the narrow path that you heard read about this afternoon, that you might walk according to his ways because of the pressure, the inward and outward pressure that comes through the meeting with God, with the people of God here. To absent yourself from the means that God has given as a gift. Hey, look, he could have had us do anything on Sunday. He could have ordained us to do any number of things on Sunday. Instead, he had ordained this. He did it so that he might keep you where you need to be. To miss it is to miss Christ, to miss his voice. Seventh, the Lord works his greatest works in public worship. I've mentioned this already, and I'm not entirely sure Clarkson didn't over-elaborate on a couple of these, but be that as it may, some of the greatest works that God does in his worship is the simple means of grace that you hear me talk about all the time. We don't need all this silliness that goes on in some churches today. We don't need a drama. We don't need all this other chicanery. We need the means of grace. We don't even do those things well. The simple things. What's that? The preaching of the word, prayer, the sacraments. That's it. Those are the dramas of the church. And often God works mightily through those works. How are people to be converted if they don't hear the word of God? How are they to hear the word of God if they don't have a preacher? How are they going to have a preacher unless he's sent? This is where it happens primarily. Public worship, eighth, public worship is the nearest resemblance of heaven. Now I know you might look around the room and say, really? Uh, I don't know. Yes, you're going to spend eternity together, worshiping together, by the way. In the Lord's day is not an ordinary day. It's a day that is crafted by God all the way through Scripture from the very beginning before the fall, all the way through God's Word as a picture. A picture of what? A picture of glory, a picture of the new heavens and the new earth, a picture of that eternal worship that we long for. That's what it is. Imagine being in glory and hearing a sermon, not from me, but from Christ. This is a picture of that which we await and look forward to. And if you hate the Lord's day, if you don't hold it in regard, if you don't miss it the way the psalmist misses it, the worship of God, well, and I say this tongue in cheek, so don't brand me a heretic, but you're really going to hate heaven. If this day troubles you, you're really going to be troubled in heaven because that's what you'll be doing. Now, I say that tongue-in-cheek, just to be sure. I know it's being recorded. I wouldn't want anybody to get all upset. I recognize that that won't be the case. But I think the point is made. Nine, the most renowned servants of God have preferred public worship before private. Ten, public worship is the best means for procuring the greatest mercies and preventing and removing the greatest judgments. All through the means that God has given, 11, the precious blood of Christ is most interested in public worship. Why? Because he died to secure the right of access to the God of heaven. And you have it. You're in his presence this very minute, and you're still breathing because of what Christ has done. Finally, the promises of God are given more public given more to public worship than to private. 
to preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove and rebuke and exhort with complete patience and teaching, to instruct and guide that all scripture is inspired of the Lord and profitable for the people. And as it's faithfully opened and expounded day after day, week after, or Lord's day after Lord's day, week after week, God's promises come to bear more so on that constant, of that, because of that constant reminder of what God has done for his people. All of these things are to be preferred and they're all true as it compares to the matter of private worship. But the problem for the psalmist is that he can't engage in this. He's prevented. Providentially, perhaps, likely, apparently. We remember 2020. I know a lot of you don't want to remember 2020, but okay, well, we can't avoid it. And we're still living in the wake of it. But many were, churches were closed, whether you agreed with that or not. Many people were prevented from being in worship, whether you liked it or not. I hope you didn't. Providentially hindered. Kept from doing what God has ordained as the means to help his people. How'd you feel about that? What did you think? When the churches began to open, did you, like the psalmist, have a great longing to be there? This is the problem of the psalmist. Of course, as a result, his enemies seize this opportunity to taunt him, to pick on him, to mock him for his allegiance, his zeal, their desire even to be where God is in this expression of worship. And so they taunt him, verses 3 and 10, as he's emotionally distraught about the fact that he cannot be where God's people are, he also has the added problem of these people, and I was being kind, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? You can almost hear the sarcasm dripping from the words. There's a godless taunt. We face that today. It's not unique to the day of the psalmist. In the face of the crisis, of this crisis, any crisis, the world rebels and mocks the godly. I always have, and, you know, they always will. All the way back from the day in which Cain rose up and killed his brother. The godly have always been attacked by the godless. One too many months ago, I read about a man who thinks Christians are duped because of their love for God and worship and religion in particular. How do you feel about that? I mean, does it make you feel good? I worked with a man who used to pick on me because I was a Christian and he said that religion is for the weak, to which I quickly responded in my New York sarcasm, you better believe it because I'm weak. Of course it is for the weak, isn't it? He faces this taunt of, of, of naysayers, the godless, the wicked, who do not understand and do not care what you and I are doing in this room. In fact, the bottom line is they think we're wasting our time. Surely there's something better to do right now, like watch football or baseball or... I'll get yelled at later for only picking sports... But they also oppress him. Verse 9, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning? Because of the oppression of the enemy. It's a double whammy in the man's life, the men's life, depending on how you read the psalm. Name calling, opposition, perhaps you have family coming to town. It's the Lord's Day. Where are you going to be? Every one of us has faced that before at some level. If you love the Lord's Day and you love his worship, then you politely say to mom, dad, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, whoever it may be, I worship on the Lord's Day. You're free to come with me. I want you to come with me. But you go. 
the likelihood of them responding kindly is probably very high. They probably won't oppress you and take you out in the backyard and beat you for it, but they probably won't come either, which in itself is a form of opposition or oppression. They don't feel very good. The psalmist recognizes all of these things. It's not aiding to his relief. Because rooted in all of this problem is a real attitude of desire to be where God's people are. He says as much when he talks about this deep longing. A deep longing there in verse 1. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. We know this is in the context of worship. We know it's in the context of the gathered people of, in worship. And I've never witnessed this. I don't, I'm not much for hunting. I don't know anything about all of that business, but I guess it's true. But I do know what it means to be thirsty. I don't need to be a deer to know what that looks like. I have been very thirsty in my life, and frankly, I would have done just about anything for a little bit of water. That's the attitude of the psalmist when it comes to being with God's people and being where God is. In his case, it would be where the temple is. In our case, it's here in a much simpler context. A deep longing, a panting soul is the way it should be rendered. It's a metaphor, of course, to drive us to think about just what kind of attitude this man possesses when it comes to being where God's people and where God is. He uses a very simple, basic staple of life, drink, of which every one of you today, in one form or another, have had. One of you, at least I know, two of us, have had more than enough coffee than we know what to do with, probably. But some of you have drank water and other things. Basic staple. This basic staple is rooted in his desire, his attitude to be where God is. He is describing a thirsty soul. My soul, verse 2, thirsts for God, for the living God. As he lived in a world with idols, he lived in a world with, with idolatry all around him. He highlights that this is not just any God I am interested in being with, but it's the living God, the God of the Bible, the true God, the God who saves me, my Redeemer, my Helper. His thirst is driven by a longing to hear from God. His attitude is further exacerbated by a burden, a burdened soul. Verse 4. These things, I remember. What things? The times in which I could worship, come and peer before God, the end of verse 2. These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would go with the throng and lead them in the procession to the house of God with glad shouts of, and songs of praise. He cannot have what he wants. And what his soul so dire is in such desperate need to receive. Because he understands is you need to understand that one of the reasons why God gave worship, public worship to you and to me is not because God needs you to worship him because he doesn't. He will be glorified by the rocks if you don't cry out. All of creation brings glory to him regardless of what you do or say. He has no need of anything from us, but he does know that you need it. And oftentimes you maybe have even experienced this as you've walked in this room. Perhaps you've been burdened. I know I have been. And I come and I see your faces and I see God's people and I see what he has done for them and done for you. And I stand here and I give the word of God to you and something changes, doesn't it? The burdens of this life suddenly become less important as we focus our attention on the God of heaven he is burdened by this. This leads to a deep grief, one of a crying heart. My tears have been my food. He switches now. He's still staying within that theme of the basic staples of life. He's, one, he's talking about water or drink, and now he's talking about food. 
highlighting further the, the centrality, the, the, the central essence and importance, vitality, life-giving labor of worship. And he says he's in tears over it. Not just occasionally, day and night. There's a crying heart being given. Perhaps it's a metaphor. I'm not sure. I'm not convinced it is. Given the tenor of the rest of the psalm, because I believe he was in abject misery. It produced tears of sadness and grief. And I wonder, friends, when is the last time you wept over the fact that you were prevented from being where God's people are? When COVID first hit, I rarely give these kinds of illustrations in sermons, but I'm going to give this one to try to highlight the point with any other reason or motive or agenda. When COVID first hit, and I was in my other call in Tennessee, I distinctly remember having a profound sense of sadness as I walked the halls of the church on that first Sunday, knowing that God's people were not going to be here today. That would make me a saint. But it does highlight the grief this man is experiencing. I cannot be where God's people are. He not only has a crying heart, he has a distressed heart. Verses 5 and also in verse 11. Why are you cast down, O my soul? He repeats that same statement more than once. It should get your attention. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Verse 11, he comes back to it again. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? He was miserable. Miserable because of the absence of worship. Miserable because of the oppressors. Miserable because of the objectors. Miserable because of the... uh, Miserable. Now, you know what miserable feels like. We've all been miserable. Miserable. He's miserable, but he's miserable because he cannot be in worship. He's a crying heart, a distressed heart, a forgotten heart. He feels forgotten. He says as much in verse 9, the very beginning, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? What was he, terrible at theology? The man's a heretic, must be. He didn't go to seminary class, apparently. He didn't have a professor that taught him well the precious doctrines of good systematic theology. No, of course not. He knows that God is everywhere present. He knows that God doesn't forget his people. He knows these things. But he sure feels that way. He sure feels like it. There's an emotion that's welling up inside of him and it's all motivated and driven by his providential, by the inability for him to be in the attendance of worship with God's people. He has a forgotten heart. Now some of you, it's always one of those times in a sermon where you just sort of hesitate just slightly but then you realize that... out of love for your people, you say these things, and that's how it's expressed. Some of you skip worship on a regular basis. You know who you are. I won't do like Paul did and call names out. I don't do that. But you know who you are. At the same time, you struggle. At the same time, You are struggling with significant issues in life. Life Life-changing issues, maybe. Numerous issues. I just wonder, maybe, suspect, perhaps, could it be that there's a direct correlation between your 
lack of zeal to be where God and his people are, where you will hear the word of God, that the life-giving word, and you will see the ministry of the church and the sacraments and the means that God has provided for you, could there be a direct correlation between that behavior and the responses of this life and the things that are weighing you down? The psalmist feels forgotten and it's no fault of his own. When it's our own fault and we rebel against the very worship of God, do you not thank God in his kindness? And it is a kindness. It's going to remind you, his child, of his love for you by bringing things across your path to remind you of the need to be where he is. Perhaps it's that. Finally, he has a mournful heart. He mourns the circumstances as one would mourn the death of a friend or a loved one. Verse 9, the end. Why do I go mourning? Because of the oppression of the enemy. But he sees in all of this one singular solution. One. The world will offer you all kinds of solutions to every problem you may have in this world. But the psalmist lands on one, one that he repeats numerous times. He hopes in God. He places his trust there. He will one day come before, the pe- before him with the people. He looks to him for comfort in his time of providential hindrance and opposition. He looks forward to the day when he will gather with the people of God and he comforts himself in his knowledge of his God. Isn't that what he says? Verse 5, why am I cast down? He says, why? Why? Why am I? Like, I doesn't know the answer. He knows the reason. And he preaches the gospel to himself by saying, hope in God, because I will again praise him. He can praise him privately, but he's speaking corporately. I will again someday come before him with the people and praise him. I will find hope and comfort there and that reality that my God has not really forgotten me. He comes back to that very theme in verse 11, hope in God for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. And that's what you must do. Perhaps you have been providentially hindered. Maybe you are today watching over the live stream. You hope in God. The Lord knows that you are hindered providentially. It's not an act of disobedience. You trust that he will minister to you as though you were here. You place your trust in that and recognize that there will be a day when God indeed will bring you to a place where you will be able to enjoy this once again. Something that we should never take for granted in the world in which we live. I suspect, in some sense, the whole COVID thing and a very excellent article of which I'm going to quote here in a minute, highlighted that perhaps the Lord in his wisdom brought COVID into the world to wake the church up. That we've been a little too lazy about the idea of being in worship with God's people. We've taken it for granted, after all. It's going to be there, and so I just show up when I get here, if I get here, on time or not. And I go through the motions, and I check the boxes, I go home, and then Pastor Bill won't beat me up for not being at church. I don't think that's the issue, is it? Certainly not the attitude of the psalmist. It ought not be ours. This article that I cited was written by, well, it happened to be one of my seminary professors. I think he's right, not because of who he is, but because I think he's right. He says, first, as we think about this psalm and as we sum it up, he says, first, may the the deprivation of public worship work in you a higher esteem for it. That is to say, when you're absent from it for providential reasons, it should work in you a heart that grows fonder to it not the other way around. That is to say, cease taking it for granted. Exclaim with the psalmist, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Are you? 
Are you glad? Do you wake up on the Lord's Day and go, this is the Lord's Day, yes! Or are you like, oh, ugh, drudgery, got to get through it, pulling teeth. I know, some days you have that feeling, guess what, so do I. Ask my wife, as I sometimes say to her, I'm calling in sick this morning. She says, you can't do that. And I say, why not? She says, well, because you're the pastor. I said, that sounds like a double standard. Other people do it. I don't always feel like being here. But then I have to change my attitude, don't I? I got to repent. I got to stop taking it for granted. Is our attitude as the psalmist in Psalm 84, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold that is to say, be a doorkeeper of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. A whole lot better to be here than to have all the pleasures of this life. A whole lot better to be a doorkeeper in the, gates, in the courts of heaven than to be chief whatever in hell. Second, maybe you need to repent of having a cavalier approach to worship. Now, I think we all need to do that at some level. We all fall short of these things. We're thankful for a Savior indeed. But maybe there's some here that just really have this problem. A sin. Repent. It's not hopeless, you know. It's the good news of Christ. Even he worshiped. Even he praised his father. Even he desired to glorify his father. Even he did all of these things that he might bring you to him and to his father. In the midst of the congregation, he's going to sing his father's praise. He's going to tell of your name to his brothers. Oh, what is he doing? This is an act of worship of the Lord himself. And he knows your weakness and he knows your struggle. And he's going to forgive you. Maybe you've allowed people or things to keep you from gathering with God's people to worship him. Maybe you've been here, you're worshiping formalistically. Going through the motions, checking the box. Rather than from faith and a prepared heart. Sporting events, other extracurricular activities, things that are lawful on other days, are they hindering your public worship? Some of you parents probably need to evaluate that a little or maybe a lot. Third, those of you who willfully neglect corporate worship need to repent of your worldliness. It's what it reveals. The way we spend the Lord's Day. What does it say about your spiritual health if your spiritual thirst is satisfied with nonsensical passing away fleeting things of this life? The psalmist certainly didn't see any hope there. He only saw it with God and his people. His soul thirsted. Don't you want more of Christ and his benefits? It's very likely, I think, that God removed during that period the privilege of corporate worship for a season, even as he did for the psalmist, to really separate the sheep from the goats. Because, my friends, if you love the Savior, you want to be with Him. If you love the Savior, you want to be with the people He died for. It happens here. It happens in corporate worship each Lord's Day. And when we find ourselves absent of it, providentially, May our souls be as the psalmist. Maybe it's not right now. If not, then you, before you even come to this table, you confess that truth to the God of heaven who loves you, has never stopped. Your attendance doesn't change his love for you. It won't end. But our love changes, doesn't it? It's fickle. And so we repent of that and we plead with the God of heaven that our souls might pant for the worship of the living God 
even as the ravaged deer pants for the water brooks. May it be true of you. May it be true of all of us. And may through it we encourage one another to worship the God of heaven, for he is so worth it, for all he has given to undeserving people, you and me. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that in times of such as this, it can be awfully pointed, but it reminds us of your love for us, your desire to see us gather and be where you are. Indeed, you have drawn us to yourself that we might be with you. And so we pray that you would renew in all of us a greater love, zeal for your worship, to sing your praise, to reflect on your beauty, to see your majesty, and to leave change different than when we entered. May you lift the burdens of this life from us and give to us that which you've promised us in your worship. We ask through the name of the one who made it all possible, Jesus Christ the righteous, in his name, amen.